Adolf Hitler being consumed by hatred, I hear you say? Surely not. Say it isn't so. He always seemed like such a fun-loving, laid-back kind of guy. Well, I'm afraid that it's true. Old Addy wasn't always as mild-mannered and friendly as his funny moustache and silly little hand gestures would have you believe. In fact, if you caught him at the wrong moment, such as, uh, well, any time between about 1913 and 1945, the genocidal fascist dictator could actually be quite unpleasant. Hitler's hatred spread far and wide, from Jews and Marxists to Roma, Sinti, Slavs, Poles, Russians, black people, gay people, trans people, disabled people, trade unionists, social democrats, Jehovah's Witnesses, and, of course, the entrance examiners at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. Oh boy, you better believe that he really hated them. Another thing that Hitler and the Nazis hated, you might be more surprised to discover, was Bayern Munich, who are now the most successful club in Germany and among the biggest football clubs in the world. I often see foreign football fans respond to or taunt Bayern Munich supporters on social media with messages like, now show us your badge between 1938 and 1945. For reference, this is the Bayern Munich badge that they are referring to, and I regret to inform you that isn't the Hindu symbol representing prosperity and good luck. The inference, when Bayern's old badge gets brought up, isn't particularly subtle. It is supposed to be evidence of close ties between Bayern Munich and the darkest period in German history, the Nazi era, and all of the negative connotations that brings with it. It has led to a perception, at least in some quarters, particularly outside of Germany, that Bayern were the most enthusiastic Nazi club of them all. After all, other German football clubs didn't have swastikas in their logos even during World War II. Not only is that not true though, it is a gross distortion, and a pretty offensive one at that. And the reality of Bayern's past, and of the relationship between Nazism and German football, is far more interesting. So in today's video, that's what we're going to focus on. Bayern Munich's relationship with Nazism, the reasons behind their swastika logo, and the bizarre world of German football, under the Nazis as a whole. The first fact which somewhat undermines the idea that Bayern Munich were an inherently Nazi club at any stage prior to the Nazis taking power in 1933 is their deep-rooted Jewish heritage. Bayern were founded in 1900, during the same year as the DFB, as football first began to be popularised in the German Empire. The club's founders were all members of the Munchner Turnverein 1879 Sports Club, but influential gymnasts at the club, who took a dim view of the up-and-coming new sport, had voted against establishing a football division to join the newly formed German Football Association. In response, football enthusiasts at Muncher Turnverein 1879 decided to split off and form their own club, FC Bayern München. Of the 17 people who signed Bayern's founding charter, two were Jewish, including Dortmund-born Benno Elkan, who fled to Britain following the rise of the Nazis in 1933. Elkan became a successful sculptor in Britain, with one of his most famous works being the giant menorah, which still stands in front of Israel's parliament building the Knesset. In 1901, a 17-year-old named Kurt Landauer from a wealthy Jewish family joined Bayern, but he soon departed to train as a banker in Luzerne, Switzerland. Landauer returned to Munich in 1905 though, and in 1913, he became Bayern's president, still aged only 29. At the time, Bayern had already had two mergers for financial reasons, and though they had tasted some success on the local level, they had struggled to establish themselves beyond that. FC Nuremberg were the undisputed titans, not only of Bavarian, but of all of German football, during the post-First World War era, winning five out of seven German championships to be crowned between 1920 and 1927, and earning themselves the nickname simply, Der Club, or The Club in English. Landauer resisted calls to build a new stadium, and instead focused Bayern's resources on improving the playing squad, looking to compete at a higher level. 
Landauer hired the Englishman William Townley as Bayern's first ever professional coach, a two-time FA Cup winner at Blackburn Rovers and former England international, who was considered to be the leading coach in German football at the time, having won the German Championship with Karlsruhe in 1910. Landauer later appointed Richard Cohen, a man who also went by the names Dombey, Little Dombey, John Little, Jack Dombey, Ricardo Dombey, and the Hungarian Wonder Doctor, despite the fact that he was Austrian. Like Landauer, Dombey was Jewish, and in 1932, the Jewish duo guided Bayern Munich to their maiden German championship in their first ever final, owing to a 2-0 win against Eintracht Frankfurt. Bayern's Jewish roots were strong then, but they weren't alone. When the Nazis took power in 1933, an estimated 10% of German Jews, totaling around 40,000 people, held official roles within local sports clubs. It is hard to imagine a better illustration of Jewish integration into German society, but nonetheless, having two Jews in such key leadership positions, singled Bayern out as having especially strong Jewish ties, an undesirable reputation, having just been crowned as national champions, on the eve of a rabidly anti-Semitic party, and Chancellor taking power. Bayern were nicknamed Juden Club, literally Jew Club by the Nazis, a derogatory and anti-Semitic term which the Nazis also used to describe Austria Vienna following the 1938 Anschluss, another club who had decidedly Jewish roots. Dombey departed as soon as the mood shifted in 1933, returning to Barcelona, before settling in the Netherlands, where he played a key role during three separate stints in establishing Feyenoord as a super team. Landauer also resigned in 1933, but in 1938 he was arrested and sent to Dachau concentration camp. Having fought valiantly for the Germans during the First World War, Landauer was given a reprieve and released from Dachau after 33 days. The rest of his family were less fortunate. His siblings Paul Gabriel, Franz and Leo were all murdered by the Nazis, meanwhile his sister Gabriella was officially deported, but disappeared never to be found. Landauer's other sister, Henny, who fled to Palestine in 1934, was the only other member of his family to survive. Landauer exiled himself to Switzerland after being released from Dachau, but whilst Bayern were forced to appoint a quote, Aryan club president, they refused to appoint a Nazi party member, as was the norm at most clubs following Hitler's ascent to power. In fact, Landauer's initial successor was a man named Siegfried Hermann, who had been his vice president, and Hermann had fallen out with the Nazis long before he was appointed by Bayern, and he sought to allow Landauer to continue to run the club from afar until he too was forced out in 1934, and later sent to serve a prison sentence in Vienna. Following Landauer's enforced resignation, Bayern went through five different club presidents in the space of the next five years. It wasn't until 1938, the same year that Bayern's badge changed, that a fully-fledged Nazi was elected president. Josef Kellner was the man in question, who became a member of FC Bayern in 1910 and of the Nazi party in 1933, having leaked official state secrets to the Nazis in the Weimar Republic. Kellner eventually rose to the role of district administrator in what is now the Czech Republic, and was allegedly involved in judgments against officials who had made statements against the Nazis or had contact with Jews. None of this was in the public domain, and very little was known about Kellner in the wider public until quite recently, as increased scrutiny has been applied to not just Bayern, but all of German football during the Nazi era. Whilst there was a great reckoning and process of denazification in Germany post-World War II, which was much more comprehensive than the reckoning that most countries have had after carrying out their own atrocities, football was rarely part of that conversation. The DFB largely washed their hands of any responsibility, portraying themselves as powerless pawns during the Nazi rise and reign, and claiming that most of their documents from that era had been destroyed during an Allied bomb raid, which had burned down the building where their files were held. Both claims are heavily disputed, and the reality paints a much darker picture of German football. Hitler himself hated football, and no senior Nazis could understand its appeal, but they did appreciate and understood its importance as propaganda. 
by the 1930s, Football was no longer a fringe sport, able to be suppressed by gymnasts at local sports clubs. It was a mass participation, an audience sport which had taken Germany by storm. The 1932 German Championship final between Bayern and Eintracht Frankfurt had a crowd of over 55,000 people, and the biggest stadiums could accommodate as many as 80,000 fans. It wasn't actually until 1935 that Jews and other so-called Untermenschen, that the Nazis considered undesirable, were formally banned from participating in sport. But as soon as Hitler came to power in 33, Jews disappeared from football, in some cases quite literally. Over 300 Jewish figures effectively or literally disappeared from football in 1933, including Godfrey Fuchs and Julius Hirsch. Fuchs scored a then-world record 10 goals for Germany in a single game, a 16-0 win against Russia at the 1912 Olympics, but fled to escape the Holocaust and managed to resettle in Canada. Hirsch, meanwhile, was Germany's first ever Jewish international, having won the German championship with Karlsruhe in 1910. A passionate German patriot, Hirsch was awarded with the Iron Cross for Extraordinary Bravery during World War I, the same decoration that a young Adolf Hitler received. Hirsch divorced his non-Jewish wife after the Nazis came to power in an effort to protect his children, and he believed that his valiance in World War I would see him spared. In 1943, Hirsch was deported from Karlsruhe to Auschwitz concentration camp, where he was killed. Hitler's disdain for football is summed up by the fact that he is believed to have only ever attended a single match. That match was the quarterfinals of the 1936 Summer Olympics, which Germany hosted. The entire games were primarily a propaganda exercise, and football was no exception. Germany versus Norway at the Poststadion in Berlin was supposed to be a major propaganda victory for the Third Reich, with Goebbels, Goering, Hess and Hitler all in attendance. It didn't turn out like that. Germany lost the game 2-0, and Hitler didn't even stay until the final whistle. I know, just when you think that your opinion of someone couldn't get any worse. To make matters worse still, as far as the Nazis were concerned, the man who scored both of Norway's goals was Magna Isaksson, a Jewish-sounding name. Isaksson wasn't actually Jewish at all, but sounding Jewish was enough to irritate Hitler, who Goebbels described in his diary as being incensed. The head coach of the Norway team, however, Asbjorn Halvorsen, was a Norwegian Jew who had spent 12 years playing for Hamburg in Germany and represented Norway at the 1920 Summer Olympics as a player before becoming Norwegian football's secretary general and acting head coach at the 1936 Olympics, where Norway took bronze. After Germany successfully invaded and began occupying Norway in 1940, Halvorsen was one of the key figures of the Norwegian sports boycott, which ground almost all organised Norwegian sports to a halt under Nazi occupation. Combine Halvorsen's highly effective activism with his Jewish identity, and he became a prime target for the Nazis. Halvorsen was arrested and held at a police station for 24 hours, before being sent to Greeny concentration camp. When he was later transferred from a concentration camp in Alsace to one in Neuengamme, close to Hamburg, according to journalist Kate Connolly, Halvorsen weighed just 40 kilograms, or 6 stone, and was suffering from typhus, pneumonia, rheumatism, and malnourishment. At Neuengamme, Halvorsen reportedly encountered his former teammate, Otto Tullharder, who wasn't a fellow inmate, but was working as a guard at the camp. Harder, who was one of Hamburg's greatest ever players and spent more than a decade playing alongside Halvorsen, joined the NSDAP in 1932, the SS in 1933, and he was drafted into the Waffen SS in 1939. Harder was eventually promoted to the role of SS Untersturmführer after serving as a guard at several concentration and death camps, and he was even a camp commander at the Erlsen subcamp when it had to be evacuated following British attacks. Halvorsen survived the Holocaust, but only just, and the typhus that he caught at the camps killed him 10 years after the war ended, aged only 56. 
Harder, meanwhile, was arrested after the Nazis lost the war and tried for war crimes, where, in his own defence, he said that he treated the prisoners well, providing them with a football pitch, and claimed that the only reason that people died was because they were used to poor quality food in the Jewish ghettos and were, quote, unable to cope with the quality and quantity of food offered to them in the camp. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison, later reduced to 10, and he was out in less than five. The contrasting fates of the two teammates of more than a decade is stark. Harder was by no means unique as a prominent figure in pre-war and wartime German football who supported or appeased the Nazis and helped to facilitate their atrocities. Felix Linnemann, the president of the DFB or equivalent from 1925 to 1945, helped to dissolve the DFB when Hitler came to power. As domestic football in Germany was overhauled, the Gauliga structures were established, Marxists and Jews were expelled, the records of German Jews were erased from the record books, and Hitler salutes were made compulsory. In 2020, it was revealed that Linnemann's role went far beyond that. As a commander of the criminal Polizei, Linnemann was, according to the DFB's own internal investigation in 2020, directly involved in the registration of Sinti and Roma as the head of the Hanover Criminal Police Control Centre. That led to several hundred Sinti and Roma people being deported to Auschwitz, where they died. Linnemann never stood trial for his crimes, and it wasn't until 2020 that he was stripped of his honorary presidency of the DFB. Broadly speaking, the Nazis were mystified at football's popularity. Hitler much preferred boxing and athletics, as he sought to create his warrior-like master race. Meanwhile, a perplexed Goebbels once wrote, following a second successive wartime defeat against Sweden, quote, 100,000 people left the stadium in a depressed state. Winning a match is of more importance to the people than the capture of a town somewhere in the east, end quote. Because of that fact, Goebbels, the Reich Minister of Propaganda and, if anything, an even more committed Nazi ideologue and anti-Semite than Hitler himself, was placed in charge of overseeing the German national team. It was a telling appointment. To the Nazis, football was viewed solely through the lens of propaganda. The fact that Goebbels knew nothing about football, well, that wasn't considered to be too big of a deal. When Germany began losing games, Goebbels began to avoid accepting fixtures against stronger teams, and when that didn't work, and Germany still lost games against the likes of Luxembourg and Slovakia, Goebbels forbid the national team from losing any more matches. Aye, that'll do it, Joseph. Actually, it didn't do it. And after a 3-2 defeat against politically neutral Sweden in front of 90,000 fans at the Olympia Stadion in Berlin in September 1942, Goebbels had seen enough. Two months later, he banned international football and decided to focus on the domestic game instead. Yes, that's right. The ingenious solution that the Nazis' propaganda minister stumbled upon was that you can't keep losing games, because you're hopeless at your job, if you just don't play anymore. Before the ban, German footballers were forced to undergo a strict Nazi education, learn and celebrate the Führer's birthday, and practice doing the perfect Nazi salute every Tuesday afternoon after training. Players had to sit an ideological exam, fail it, and you were off the team pass it, and you gained certain privileges, such as subsidised rail travel and a small fee for representing the national team. The latter was highly unusual for the Nazis, who looked to stamp out the creeping professionalism that had been coming into German football before they came into power. After Landauer was released from Dachau and moved to Switzerland, Bayern travelled to Zurich to play a friendly game against the Swiss national team in 1943. By this stage, the club had been completely gutted of its Jewish players, administrators, and identity, but the affinity towards Landauer endured. Concerned at that fact, the Nazis prohibited Bayern's players from meeting Landauer during their time in Switzerland, but they couldn't actually prevent Landauer from attending the game. When Bayern's players spotted Landauer in the crowd after the match, they lined up and applauded their former president in a prominent act of defiance. At the time, Landauer knew that he had lost everything. He had lost his job, his home, and almost all of his family who had been murdered at Dachau, and now the Gestapo were preventing him from even interacting with the club that he had built up for the preceding two decades. 
but still, he retained the affection of FC Bayern. It wasn't the only act of defiance that Bayern were involved in. In 1934, Bayern's players were involved in a brawl with Nazi brown shirts. Two years later, Bayern winger Willy Zemitz Streiter, who was renowned for his speed, made a point of having his picture taken with the African-American track athlete Jesse Owens, who enraged Hitler at the 1936 Olympics by winning four gold medals, undermining the idea of Aryan physical and athletic supremacy. Bayern fullback Siegmund Haringer was nearly sent to prison for describing a Nazi flag-waving parade as kids' theatre, meanwhile club captain Connie Hardkamp and his wife hid Bayern's entire trophy cabinet following an appeal by Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering for football clubs to hand over their silverware to be melted down to help the war effort. Few other clubs defied Goering's appeal. Ultimately, football didn't prove to be very fertile ground for propaganda for the Nazis, but not for the want of trying. A relatively weak and horribly mismanaged national team meant that it resulted in more propaganda failures than success stories. Yet the domestic game was still a powerful tool of Nazification, aided by supporters and collaborators at almost every level of the game. And that is kind of the point. It's not as though there aren't dark truths or hidden secrets worth scrutinising about German football's past, most of which went unchallenged until the early 2000s, but that makes it all the more important to focus on real abuses and injustices rather than imagined ones. Bayern Munich were not wholly angelic resistance fighters throughout the Nazi era. History tends to be a bit more complex than that. Between 1933 and 1945, 21 of Bayern's 41 board members were members of the NSDAP, and in the early 2000s, Bayern reportedly refused to pay into a compensation fund for former Nazi slave labourers, stating that they themselves were victims of the Nazis. Many critics claim that Bayern had gravely missed the point of the fund. Nonetheless, Bayern's 1932 championship pioneered by two Jews, did put a target on their back. Unlike Austria Vienna, the other so-called Juden club, Bayern weren't forced to change their name, but they were targeted by the Nazis, and their swastika badge was viewed as a form of punishment. In the final wartime football match played in Germany, a week before Hitler committed suicide by gunshot, and two weeks before Germany unconditionally surrendered to the Allies, Bayern beat their rivals 1860 Munich 3-2. In 1947, Kurt Landauer was one of few high-profile German Jews to make a speedy return to Germany, where he was once again appointed as Bayern's club president. He remained in the role until 1951, when he failed to get re-elected, and he died in Munich in 1961. It wasn't until the early 2000s that, thanks partly to Bayern's ultras, Landauer's legacy was properly appreciated and celebrated with banners and memorials. In 2013, he was named as Bayern's honorary president. In 2005, the DFB established the Julius Hirsch Prize for outstanding examples of integration and tolerance within German football. Bayern Munich were the award's first recipients, after hosting a game between their under-17 team and a combined Israeli-Palestinian youth selection. It took Bayern a lot of time to rebuild following World War II, and the club was on the verge of being declared bankrupt in the late 1950s. It wasn't until the holy trinity of Franz Beckenbauer, Gerd Muller, and Sepp Meyer came along in the 1960s that Bayern returned to the heights that they scaled under Landauer and Dombey in 1932, winning their first Bundesliga title in 1969 and a trio of European Cups during the 1970s. There are lots of legitimate reasons to dislike Bayern Munich, principal among them, from an outsider's perspective, the fact that their dominance over the past decade has all but removed any semblance of excitement at the top end of what would otherwise be perhaps the most competitive and entertaining league in Europe throughout so much of that time. The club's badge between 1938 and 1945, though, forced upon them by the Nazis due to their reputation as a Jewish club, probably isn't one of them. The reality is that Germany's biggest and most successful football club was co-founded by Jews, they were inspired to their first German championship by two Jews, and still their longest ever serving president was a Jewish German, despite being exiled from his role for 12 long years by the Nazis. 
That is a remarkable legacy, and one which profoundly undermines the Nazi ideology of Aryan supremacy and Jewish or untermensch racial and social inferiority. Those who seek to tie by into the Nazis, therefore, when they were actually despised by them, and ignore their deep-rooted Jewish heritage, typically only for partisan or tribal football trolling reasons, are actually, without realising it, I'm sure, making a pro-Nazi argument, or at least serving to undermine a powerful argument against Nazi dogma. Bayern Munich's first German championship in 1932 was evidence not only of Jewish excellence, far from racial or social inferiority, but far more importantly, of Jewish integration and assimilation at the heart of one of Germany's most recognisable and influential institutions. And that'll never be forgotten. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, make sure that you're subscribed, it goes without saying, and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be on or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. They might be a bit more light. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, and all of those links plus a whole lot more should be down in the video description below. Cheers.